Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette. And I'm Jamie Albright. And this week on the show, we have Nick Thacker. Yes, we do. And he it was a great guest. It was so fun. I yeah. laughed a lot in that interview. Yeah. His stories were funny. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we talked a lot about just um, having processes and systems mm-hmm. in place to be productive and get your goals met. And yeah, I was going to say, he's a systems guy. Mm-hmm. Very much into systems. And mm-hmm. he writes um, action adventure thrillers. And we talked a lot about the balance between plot and character. Mm-hmm. And um, he does some interesting things like with um, email for authors, like mm-hmm. specifically designed only for authors. And he's got a nonfiction book. So we covered a lot. Yeah, we did. We did. So what's been going on with you this week? Um, this week, I have been working on the update to the Ingram Spark course that's in SPF 101. Mm-hmm. Um, the interface with English Spark has changed since I recorded it. So I'm re-recording some of it. So it'll make sense. So when you log mm-hmm. in, you know, the buttons will be in the right place. And that's something I've been trying to get to for like, I don't know, a week or two. And I feel like mm-hmm. I just keep getting stuff done and then something else falls on my list that right. I have to do, but I'm feeling better. I'm feeling a little more not so disorganized. I'm very Good. much a creature of routine mm-hmm. and my routine has like been blown out of the water with all this yes. stuff. And right, right now we're kind of waiting. We're like poised. Mm-hmm. Not much can happen because we're at the point where we can't really pick up everything. Right. But um, So I have that going on. And then the other thing I want to talk about is um, my book, How to Write a Series, is going to be on sale for 99 cents when this comes out. It'll be on sale from um, May 31. Oh, so wow. June cool. 4th, I think. Yeah. So if you're listening in real time, the, it will be on sale along with another a whole group of nonfiction books. And I'll have the link in the show notes so you can go and grab, you know, a whole bunch of books for 99 cents. That's great. Yeah. That great. So that's what I got going on. And what about you? Um, well, I wrote to the end of my book last night. I know. Yay. I never thought it would happen. <laughs> <laughs> but you uh, always get it done. <laughs> yeah. So it's a mess. It's a hot mess. But um, I'm going back through it. Started this morning, back at the beginning, just fixing things. Because you know, halfway through, I make a decision to change something, and then mm-hmm. so I have to go back and change it at the beginning. You know, because, yeah. and um, then it goes to the developmental editor next. For, I'll probably send it Friday uh, mm-hmm. because we're we're leaving town on Saturday. But um, then. I listened to a great, uh, great podcast, the Spa Girls podcast this week. It has Renee Rose on it, and she's talking about positivity and mindset, and it's really great. Um, it's pretty. I mean, she's pretty woo woo by her own admission, but even if you're not, it's it's still really good stuff to think about, and you know what we're kind of what we're putting out there, you know, and that mm-hmm. that affects how we think. And oh yeah, anyway, yeah, it was really, it was very good. It was very good. But other than that, I've I've just been working and stuff. Okay. So yeah, well, not a whole lot. Pretty boring. Yeah. yeah. Well, I have a question. Have you a streaming question? Have you uh-huh. watched? Because Jamie has much wider viewing habits than I do. <laughs> have you watched <laughs> Miss Scarlet and the Duke? Yes, I love so Miss Scarlet. And, that? Yes, I would recommend it highly. Okay. It's well, really, I'm, I'm probably great. gonna be diving into that. Yeah, that I loved good. it. I started watching it, I guess, when it first came out because they put it out an episode at a time. Right. So I had to wait. I couldn't stream, oh. you know, I couldn't binge it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, really great. Loved it. I, hadn't, I didn't know about it. I think I saw a preview a long time ago and I missed it. And then it got recommended to me or mm-hmm. I saw something on my Instagram feed and I was like, oh, this looks mm-hmm. like something mm-hmm. I might like. Yeah. It, <laughs> it, um, like the first couple of episodes... I like, I like, cause it's a mystery, you know, the mm-hmm. whole thing, but I, um, was kind of like, mm, that guy is really grinding my gears. Like he <laughs> is bothering me, but 
stick with it because he okay. it gets so much better and he I mean he gets better and um anyway yeah I, I love it it's it's just a, it's a really great show it's got some really okay. interesting cool. things and mysteries in it so that's cool yeah all right well that's good to know okay yep. all right well I guess we should get on with the interview. yeah let's do it all right here we go mm-hmm. today we're really excited to have Nick Thacker with us how are you doing Nick I'm doing well. Thank you. We're glad you're here. Yeah. So let's read your bio and we'll get started. Nick Thacker is the USA Today bestselling author of action adventure thrillers and mysteries. He writes and speaks about the future of books and publishing and is the founder of numerous author centric businesses, including author.email and radiowrite.com. He lives on a volcano in Hawaii with his wife, two kids and two dogs. Oh, that's great. I love that. Um, lives on a volcano. I live on a vic- volcano, but uh, it's not natural. It's not a bit natural. Point. It's a figurative <laughs> volcano. Yeah, it's a figurative volcano. Figurative. That's right. It feels like a volcano. <laughs> it does. So tell us how you got into writing, Nick. Uh, well, very simply, um, I hated writing when I uh, was growing up. And uh, I just, you know, I was in like the what do they call them? I don't know, advanced English classes or whatever. I shouldn't have been, but they threw me in those and made me write essays every day. And it was, you know, read this book that no one in history has ever liked um, and write a book report on it. You know, um, I apologize to all the literature fans out there, but I, uh, I, I sort of hated writing. I, I thought I'm never going to do this. Why, why do you know, being a high school kid, I was like, I'm never going to do this. Why, why am I writing? And I remember um, the moment I got sucked into, I loved to read as a kid. And then sort of lost interest in it in in the high school years as I was reading all these literature books and things I wasn't interested in. I mean, I remember the moment I was sitting for a test at some point, I think it was maybe college or high school, end of high school. And I I finished the test and I brought a book that was on my dad's nightstand and it was called the Da Vinci code. And Mm -hmm. I remember just immediately getting sucked in and, um, you know, say what you will about Dan Brown's writing uh, yep. quality or, or style. Um, the story was so fun and the characters were great. I just, and everything about it was, was for me, it was a perfect book mm-hmm. and I read it in, in a few sittings, you know, just very quickly. And, um, you know, I, I found that this was a, a genre that I could actually really enjoy. And so I started reading what I call now, um, action adventure thrillers or archeological fiction is what some people call it. Mm-hmm. Um, with a lot of um, truth and history and thing, you know, wrapped around this, this core idea of uh, something that, that what if kind of question. Um, and anyway, and so uh, shortly after I got married, um, we were in Round Rock, Texas. And I, uh, my dad, my, my dad's dad, my grandfather had passed away uh, that year. And I, I looked at my wife and I said, you know, what I'm going to do um, for Christmas. I'm going to give my dad a book that I wrote. I'm going to write a book and give it to my dad for Christmas. You know, very naive. I was like, <laughs> how hard can it be? Right. Yeah. I've read a bunch of these things and um, you know, if they can do it, I can do it. Uh, of course, which is the most naive thing ever. But I contend to this day that if I did not know, if I knew how hard it would be, I never yeah. would have done it. So, you know, I jumped in head first. Correct. I just said, Oh, yeah. okay. I've, I've read an, an, a bunch of these books and therefore I'm <laughs> somehow qualified to write one. Um, and so I, uh, I started writing and it, it did okay at first. And I got to the muddy middle and I didn't know it was called the muddy middle at the time. Right. But I got there. Uh, and I very quickly realized it was very muddy. Um, I had all these plot lines going different places and there was no chance I was going to, you know, shore them up or anything. But I, um, I tried to keep going, tried to keep going. And about the middle midpoint of the novel, I, I, almost threw in the towel, but I said, I'm gonna take a break. And I'm just, you know, I'm gonna see if there's any information out there about how to write a novel. Like maybe somebody's written a book about how to do this. Um, Of course that opened the flood. Yeah, I know. I know. (laughs) If I'm setting myself up as an idiot, then um, you're getting, you're getting the theme here. Um, And that's, that's how I, that's, that's how I approached it. And of course I found a bunch of books that, that helped me. I, I plowed through all those really quickly, loved the whole idea of structure and plotting and character development. Um, as a, as kind of the, the pedagogy, right? As how to do this, how to learn this. And um, I found a book by Dwight Swain called Techniques of the Selling Writer, which really resonated with me. Um, the, the more modern version is, uh, I think Jack Bickham was his uh, student and he wrote Scene, uh, is it Scene and Structure? Same sort of idea, same same sort of book. Mm-hmm. And um, so I read those and, and really loved them and I tried, you know, say, okay, well, I'm gonna finish this book now and I'm gonna apply what I learned. Um, and it wasn't good, but I finished. And that became the first book I ever wrote was called the golden crystal. It's now uh, the Atlantis stone. I've since gone back and thankfully 
fixed it and rewritten <laughs> most of the most of the thing. Um, but I, I did what I said I was going to do. I gave it to my dad on Christmas morning. And you know, I the whole point back then, I didn't know anything about self-publishing. I didn't know anything about Kindle or whatever. I just said, I want a quote unquote real book, um, which meant, you know, hardcover with my name on it and nice cover design. I paid a friend to, to design it. Um, and she did a bang up job. It looked great. And so my dad had no idea at first that it was my book. Um, he said, oh, the golden crystal. Cool. It's a, it's a book. Thanks. You know, and then my mom, she, she said, hey, well, look who wrote it. And he goes, holy blank, you know, yeah. and I can't, you, what you wrote this, you know, you had no idea. So it was a really cool, special moment. And um, long story short, what happened was um, as I was writing the thing, I had all these plot holes that I could never fill. And so I would just go back and take them out of that book. I just, okay, well, that doesn't fit. I can't do that. Um, there was a, an article about a sea cockroach, which is just this giant, disgusting, ugly thing that looks like it's going to eat your face. And I wanted to put that in there. I, like, oh, I got to put the co- cockroach in there. Well, I couldn't, I couldn't, it didn't fit. So I just put it in an Evernote document, an Evernote folder and saved it. And, uh, that stuff became the second book and the third book mm-hmm. and the fourth book, you know, it was my swipe file for mm-hmm. ideas. Um, so after I finished the first one, I just, I started writing the second one and, um, I bought into the, this, I, I'd read something online about how you're supposed to just put your book in the drawer for a little while and work on the next one and just keep going. And so I did that. And I just, I ended up writing three books on unrelated. They're all standalone. Um, and they got better and better and better. And, um, eventually I, decided to write a sequel to the third book and then, you know, a a third one. And it just went on and on. And pretty soon I I looked up and I was making, you know, like in a utility payment every month Mm -hmm. from, from books. Mm -hmm. Um, And and we know how we know the rest of the story. Right. And and all of a sudden it was a mortgage payment or a rent payment. Mm -hmm. And um, at some point it was like, wow, this is actually lining up with um, what I'm making at my day job. And so going to be, you know, the question like, what, at what point do I leave and, and just focus on the writing full time? So mm-hmm. that's the long answer um, to how I started writing, but it was all, I consider it kind of an accident. Right. Staring well, you know, my, it. my story is very similar. I was going to write yeah, a yeah. book for my best friend uh, because she was my reading buddy and it was her birthday. I too was very naive and ignorant, but I did buy writing romance for dummies. No lie. It actually oh, was quite good. <laughs> I mean, looking back, I'm like, that was some good information, but yeah, it, they usually things. are. They're very yeah. condensed. Yeah. They're very good. Those, those, I, I like the dummy series. Those are yeah. good. And so, I, I've heard your story. I've heard you, heard you talk yeah. about that before. Jamie. Yeah. <laughs> it's very funny that we uh, sort of stumbled into it the same way. That's, very accidental on my yeah. part. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, it was very cool. The inspiration that, that drove you to mm-hmm. write a book for your dad, for your dad. Yeah. yeah. That's very cool. Yeah. Well, and, and to kind of finish some of that, I, I didn't, I didn't even think about this, but I, um, I'm going to start adding to that story because it's come full circle. Now my dad is, is an engineer. He's a civil engineer, um, at a research company in San Antonio and he is, um, brilliant. And so he, he works with these guys who are even more brilliant and they, they build things that they can't even talk about. So that's the kind of stuff that they're doing, right. Mm. Which is perfect for my fiction. Sure. Um, and so just the other day I thought, you know, hey, I'm going to launch a new series. Um, I haven't even announced it to anybody yet. Um, so I can you two the first, um, mm-hmm. but I want to write a techno thriller series and oh, it's going to be, God. it's going to be deeper technically or more technically accurate and, and a little bit deeper um, than the stuff that I've been writing, which is like, well, what if, and you know, here's some science we can duct tape together and, and make the bad guy, you know, have a cool, you know, gun or whatever. This is going to be more on the line of like, you know, how computers actually work and some quantum computing and things. So mm-hmm. I called my dad and, you know, not only did I get the answer to my question of how could I make this work? He was like, Oh, here's what you need to do. You need to have this and this and this, and I'll send you all these articles. And, <laughs> and it's just amazing the, the information I'm getting from him. I don't even understand half of it, but yeah. it's, it's real stuff, you know? And so that's, it's really cool to be able to have someone like him who was my first reader, my first demographic, you know, um, yeah. still reads my books and, and loves them and um, doesn't even tell me about all the things that I get wrong, which is great. That's it's great. Good. <laughs> that is, that's a good dad. <laughs> <That's> the best. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've kind of already touched on this a little bit, but what is your definition of success and how has it changed? Probably like finishing that first book was like beginning, yes, but how has it changed yeah. over time? It, it definitely is a moving target for me. And I, I try to purposefully make it a moving target, meaning I don't ever want to have a, just a defined notion of success. Like if I'm going to make $50,000 a year, because I'm going to get there. And then all of a sudden, what do I, you know, what do we do next? It has to change, right? The goalpost has to move, if you will. And so for me right now, success means I want to make my job and my wife's job completely optional. 
Um, I want to be successful enough where um, I don't have to write every single day if I don't want to. If we want to go travel the world, we can do that. Um, you know, I don't want to throw a dollar amount on it because it really there's just so many variables at play. Right. But that's sort of the, the, the upper echelon of success for me right now is if I can work on building my business um, such that I've got a way to keep, you know, advertising, um, keeping my books where they need to be sticky, if you will, in the Amazon um, store. Um, and, and I've got people around me that, that are assistants who can help with certain administrative recurring tasks. Um, and, and the income is there, then we don't need to be in one place. Now we will, because my kids are going to be in school and all mm-hmm. that. But um, to be able to have that freedom, I think is my definition of success right now. And that mm-hmm. certainly has changed from where it was before, you know, before yeah. it was like, okay, just hold on, pay down the credit card bills. Um, hope I can pay, you know, a little, you know, have an extra 50 bucks to go out to a dinner or something. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that was, that was a few years ago, but um, it's changed since then. So it'll change next time we talk, I'm sure mm-hmm. too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is, it is uh, fluid, I would say, um, because I used to think it was bad that I moved, constantly moved the goalpost, but I realize now that's just kind of part of this business. And so it, the trick is doing it in a healthy way, you know, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, celebrating, yeah, absolutely. celebrating your successes, but still looking to what else you want to do. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I think there's so many, the celebration part is huge. And I, I've, you know, we talked about Kevin before the, the recording started. He and I mm-hmm. used to have this, this tradition, like weekly, we would say, Hey, let's, what's a small victory we can celebrate just me and you just together. Mm-hmm. What's something we can have a, have a drink of scotch, you know, over. Um, it could be anything. And because I think we lose sight of that as, as driven, um, you know, entrepreneurial authors, as most mm-hmm. of us are, um, we want to set a goal and then we want to achieve the goal. And then what's the next goal? And that's great. Um, but there, there's two sides of it, right? If, if we don't hit that goal or, or we haven't hit that goal yet, sometimes we feel like we're living in a perpetual state of failure, mm-hmm. right? Because well, I haven't achieved it yet. I haven't achieved it yet. I'm still tied to the man, you know, I'm still paying tax and whatever it is. Um, and then the other side of it is we set the goal, we get the goal. And then we say, great, what's the next goal. And we forget to celebrate that we've achieved, we've accomplished something pretty big. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. you know, and so what I've done is I've just tried to systematize everything, um, when, when it comes to goals, you know, so for example, if I could set a goal of making a hundred thousand dollars a year in net profit, um, and that's fine. But what I really need to do to be successful at that is set up a system, um, that will get me there. And then I can work on the system and every single day, every single moment I can either be accomplishing that system or not. And, and I can, you know, redirect as needed, but I can succeed every single, I can be successful every single day because I've, I've done what I said I'm going to do. If it's right, 2,500 words every morning. Um, sure. I can, I can fail quote unquote fail one day. Um, but then the next day I can get back on the horse, right. And I can write right. 2,500 mm-hmm. words and then I've accomplished that system and I've, I'm mm-hmm. successful. Mm-hmm. And then most likely if I've, deconstructed the goal properly. And if that's truly the way to get to that goal, then at the end of that time, I've accomplished a goal, but more importantly, I'm successful and I feel successful every day because I've set up a system of success. Right. Yeah. Very good. No, no, I think that's (laughs) awesome. I think that's awesome. So what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft when you started? Um, Everything. Yeah. (laughs) 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 <laughs> everything. I mean, really, I, I came into this so just not even naive, but like I said, I kind of touched on early in my, in my school days, right. I actively railed against learning things mm-hmm. about writing in English. I don't want to conjugate verbs. I don't want to mm-hmm. do it in French class. Why would I want to do it in English class? Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I just didn't, I was getting this information. It was being downloaded into my head. Right. But I didn't know how to, I didn't process any of it. I didn't understand that you use a possessive pronoun in a gerund phrase. I don't know what any of those words mm-hmm. meant. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was sort of being fed all this information in school that I of course would use later, but I didn't have any reason to, and there was no mm-hmm. application for it. And so I wish I would have known that all of that information that I was getting could potentially be very useful to me if I would have just shut up and paid attention a little mm-hmm. bit better. Mm-hmm. Um, but I didn't. And here we are. And I'm successful despite that. Right. And mm-hmm. I think because um, of, of the loving and caring teachers that I had in English, truly really good people um, kind of beating me over the head with some of this stuff. Um, I've been able to, to make it work, but really um, I think it comes down to, for me, the two, the, 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 the two big components of this were understanding that 
every single book. And then again, this is very specific to me. This may not be for every writer. Um, if you're listening out there writing some different genre, that's very different. Fine. But for me personally, in the genre that I'm writing, understanding that it's all about plot. Mm. And yet at the same time, it's all about character. Mm. Um, these were the two, it was a dichotomy, right? It was a false mm -hmm. dichotomy back then where I thought, well, all the books that I'm reading that I love the, that I want to write, well, they're all plot driven. It's all about the plot. Um, and the truth was the really good books were actually character driven that had a good plot. Um, but I didn't, I was too stupid to pay attention to the fact that there were actually characters in the novel, right? Mm -hmm. It was just like, well, what's the next plot? What's the next plot device? Mm -hmm. What's the next thing? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I really wish I would have focused more on all those books that I read and, and still read, um, on, on how the characters are being developed and what they're doing. Because early on, I think all, every single one of my characters was really just me, mm -hmm. <laughs> male, female, in between whatever it was, it was, you know, it was this cardboard version of me, sarcastic yeah. and, yeah. you know, arrogant or whatever. And that's how they came across in the books. And um, I've really tried to change that now. I think the plot, you know, okay, hey, the plot's there. Like I, I've, mm -hmm. I figured that part out for the most part. Um, how do I really make the characters somebody the readers want to latch onto or put themselves inside or whatever? Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah. that's the two, that's the big one, the false dichotomy of but it's yeah. all about plot or it's all about character. Mm -hmm. No, it's both. Right. It and going back to Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code, like that, that book was, you know, of course, heavily plot driven, but also character driven. Like I wanted to know why is that guy constantly self-flagellating? Um, is that the word? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why is he yes. doing Except, like, Yep, it is. Like yeah. it was so, um, yeah, creating characters that you want to know about, even if they're yeah. the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Why I want to know why they're doing what they're doing. So yeah, yeah. that's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I learned. I mean, I, I found out later on as I was thinking about it, um, that plot doesn't work without a Robert Langdon. You know, who's yeah. a, a believable symbologist, a professor of yeah. symbology. You can't just yeah. take him out and put something else in there. No. You know, it doesn't yeah. work, and so. Yeah, I, I'm slowly starting to come on. I'm a pretty slow learner, it seems. Um, but uh, that's that's what I'm. That's the, my big one now is what I wish that's I would have known then. Yeah, yeah, that's great. I kind of done the same thing because I I write mysteries, and you know the plot's very important in mysteries. You've got, and that was what I was focused on. And it's only as I've been writing a couple of years that I've realized that the characters are what bring people back. I don't think I've ever heard right. anybody say, "Wow, that book has such a good plot." You know. They, right. they want the characters. Mm -hmm. And so like now I'm trying to focus more on the characters. I think that that's maybe certain genres you have a tendency to maybe like for me, I had to deconstruct the plot and figure out how to do the plot. And now I can add characters to that now that I've gotten that down. So yeah, it's a very, mm -hmm. I think that's very common in certain genres. It seems yeah. like it. And it definitely seems like a genre that I'm in that, that, you know, mystery too, is very, it seems we, we always say it's plot driven, right. As if that's mm -hmm. like more important than characters. And so I, I bought into that myth, you know, I bought into mm -hmm. that idea that, well, that's just going to have a really tight plot and all the, you know, got to hit the beats at the right point. I'm an outliner, you know, so I was like, got to hit all these beat points and midpoint and uh, you know, inciting incident. It's like, great. I got all that down. I did that. Why are, why are people not really wanting to read the book? Why, mm -hmm. why is it not selling as well as it should? Um, mm -hmm. You're, you nailed it. I mean, it's just people want to come back because, excuse mm -hmm. me, the, the 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 characters that are in there, um, we yeah, got to well, care about them, right? Yeah. Yep, exactly. Well, yeah. What about marketing? What do you wish you had known about marketing? Uh, marketing is a little, a little bit different for me. I always say that I came into this as a marketing guy rather than, uh, you know, an author guy. Um, I had a job that was marketing outside of, uh, right out of college. Um, and so was, I was writing my first book. I would, you know, hide under the cubicle, take a nap or, you know, write. But I was in a marketing, I was doing marketing stuff. I was in a marketing environment. And what that means is, I mean, I was specifically doing website development and design and, you know, customer support for that. But, um, it was all geared toward marketing and, and getting your message out there and trying to, you know, compete against all these other people trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, all that really means is um, early on, I, I didn't have any question in my mind that building a mailing list was important. I, I just sort of knew intuitively that I needed to get people on a mailing list. So I got really lucky. Um, I started doing that from day one. I wrote a book, I published a book, and that book was my freebie. Don't tell mm -hmm. Amazon because I was also selling it on Amazon at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I wrote the second book and did the same thing in the third book and did the same thing. And so when I had three books out, they were the same three books that you could get for free signing up for my mailing list, because that's how important it was for me to develop that, 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 uh, list. Um, now there's all kinds of things I didn't know about marketing. Um, 
And you know, to say, I wish I would have known them known then that's true, but it's also true that a lot of those things have changed so much over time, meaning the tactics have changed, right? Mm -hmm. There was no yeah. such thing as a book funnel, you know, or, yeah. uh, or Insta freebie before, you know, whatever, uh, I think prolific works, whatever it is now. Yeah. Um, there's no such thing as book brush or author email or that kind of stuff. And so, um, strategically, I had a pretty good uh, foundation of marketing. Like I, I kind of, I knew, okay, great. I'm now a business called Nick Thacker author. Mm -hmm. um, and I need to operate like a business and I need to pay taxes like a business. So all that stuff was sort of in, ingrained in me. And I had no, I actually liked that. I, I had no problem with that. As a lot of authors tend to, you know, struggle with, they, they just want to write the book. Um, I, I wish I would have given myself the freedom to hire help a little bit earlier. Um, I'm just now getting to the point where I'm, I'm really trying to nail down like the, the VA PA thing oh. and help. And I've got a, a good friend of mine who's doing um, my cover designs now. And that's coming from, I've done all my own covers and I hmm. consider myself a pretty good cover designer. I've won awards for it. So I, somebody thinks I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. um, but the point is I'm good enough to do them. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm just now getting to the point where I'm realizing I don't need to be the one doing them. Um, you know, I used to, I used to, my day job was working for a church. I was a worship guy randomly, mm -hmm. actually. Um, so I did music and everything, but I had a great pastor who was a, a good friend of mine and, and pretty much a mentor at this point. Um, and he told me all the time, he said, Hey, you just need to find what it is you need done and find somebody who can do it 80% as good as you, mm -hmm. and then just let them do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so th that's really wise, right? That makes sense. You know, but then there was a part of me that was like, well, if it's only 80%, good, then I don't want, you know, I can, I can make it hundred percent good. <laughs> that was the trap that I fell into. And what yeah. I'm now starting to realize in my, you know, infinite wisdom, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, is that what he was saying, I think, isn't that it's going to be 80% good. It's just going to be 80% as good as you could do Nick. Mm -hmm. And Nick isn't perfect. Yeah. Right. So right. Nick wouldn't do a hundred percent of the job that the hundred, the book cover is good, but it's not a hundred percent, the perfect book cover ever. Right. So mm -hmm. giving it to somebody else might be 80% of what I could do, but they're going to have completely different eyeballs mm -hmm. looking at it in a completely different mind and, and experience yeah. skill set they can bring to it, which means it may be 110% of what I could do. Right. And yeah. so that's what I'm finally starting to realize, like all these books that I'm having Dave do are better than what I could <laughs> design. Mm -hmm. Period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have personal experience with that because like I have started outsourcing stuff over the last couple of years and I've learned that the person that I'm working with, she is excellent at spreadsheets and mm -hmm. I'm not. And mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. I've gotten to the point now where I'm like, Hey, right. I created a draft. Can you make this better? And does it do whatever you do to it? And she'll go in and she'll change the way stuff is organized. And then it's so much easier to use, you know, and it just makes sense. So, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So like different skills, you have different things. And if you can find the people that you can hand things off to and not worry about, then that's the best. Yeah. 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 I, I have what this curse where I'm uh, good enough at a lot of things, but really not good at it, like great at any of them. And that, that bleeds <laughs> into, and I know we're going to probably talk about it later, like the things like author email, the, the software tools that I try to build. Mm -hmm. I'm not a developer. I'm not a programmer. You right. know, I'm a reverse, right. I'm a professional reverse engineer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and so I, I tend to go down a rabbit hole. I'm like, I have this idea. Like I want to build a radio station that plays background music for writers and podcasts that are all geared to writers. And oh, what a great idea. And then I'll spend like five days building this tool when I could have just got on Fiverr and given somebody <laughs> um, the opportunity who really can use the money and is a really, really gifted at this to just do it in three hours. Right. Um, you know, right. and, and then I can have it and say, hey, you know, I made this, I'm, I'm working on this, you know? So I'm just now finally realizing that um, I should have outsourced my entire life about five years ago. <laughs> it takes us a while to realize that. So what assumptions did you learner, make? I'm a slow learner, like I said. Yeah, well, me too. Um, <laughs> what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career? And looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Um, most every assumption I've ever made has turned out to be wrong. I, I like to say the older <laughs> I get, the more that I know and the less confident I am about any of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and yeah. I mean, honestly, you can quote me on that. It is something that is so true for me in just about every aspect of politics, religion, yeah. Yeah. Like, whatever, like yeah. it's yeah. just been true for everything. And it's mm -hmm. very true for writing. You know, the assumption I think a lot of us have is I know that most books aren't going to make it and they're not mm -hmm. going to be big and they're not going to be runaway successes, but mine mine yes. can do it. This one's going to be different. 
this one's just special. And Hey, you know what? Like you're special. Like it, the book is special because it's yeah. yours, yeah. but it ain't that great compared to all the other crap that's out there. Right. right and so right, right. I think that was the first lesson that I learned. And I learned very bigly um, was, uh, you know, Hey, my book is not going to be a runaway success. It's not even going to be like a petering, <laughs> like puttering small time success. It's just going to be a book that's out there. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was before Kindle kind of blew up, right? The 2011, mm-hmm. 2010, mm-hmm. like whatever that was. Um, this was right around that time when people were starting to discover that there was a thing called Kindle. Mm-hmm. Um, this was back when, you know, the John Locks of the world could get on and, and mm-hmm. you know, go to the stratosphere with um, arguably less work than, than it takes now. I, yeah. That's all I'll yeah. say about that. But I learned that the, you know, I would say that learned it the hard way, but at the same time, I also didn't have the expectation. So I had an assumption, but I didn't have the expectation that it would be huge because it was just written for my dad, that first book, you know, um, it was really like the third or fourth book where I started to think, oh, this could be a career. This mm-hmm. could be possible. I could see how this could work. This is the same thing that Michael Anderley discovered, right? With 20 books. He, he did the math and he was like, well, okay, um, it's going to take 20 books and I can make 50 K and retire in Cabo or, you know, wherever it was. Um, and, and obviously it takes far less than that if you are able to do certain things in, in the right way. But mm-hmm. um, that's what I essentially learned was, um, no, it's not going to probably be one book. It's probably going to be a lot of books and it's going to be a, a career. And mm-hmm. you could, it's harder to be um, a failure than it is to be a success, I think, if you do those things, if you write more books and you keep publishing regularly. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's actually very, very possible. It's plausible it's likely that you'll be successful, I think. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know that early on. I just made the assumption right. that, well, okay, but this is this is it. This is the only book I'm going to write. It better be really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Well, sometimes you just have to get through that first phase, get the book done and out, and then you can, you know, figure out next steps after that. So. So. Oh my God. I feel like that every single book, if mm-hmm. I can just get through this book, if I can just get through this one, <laughs> yeah. I'm never going to do this ever again. It's good. This is it. <laughs> well, I, uh, I knew that I would write two. I think once I got into Rockstar, I knew, okay, there'll be two of these. And so I put every good joke I have in those two books and now I'm regretting mm. it a lot. <laughs> I, I used up all my good jokes in those first two books and now I'm having to really now work you have hard. to work really hard. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I feel that. I feel that deeply. Yes. <laughs> well, we like to talk about like lessons learned and what you wish you had known. So one of the questions we like to ask is, have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? The cloud with a silver lining question. Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, yes. So the, the, my second book, so actually, uh, you know, the very first book, um, the goal with that, and I was very, very clear about this goal, finish the damn book, right? Like that was it. That was what I wanted to do. That was the whole purpose of it was finish a book. Right. Um, and so, you know, wisely I thought, well, Hey, well maybe every book I write should have a goal that's similar to that. Right. Um, but I already finished one book. So the second book, that shouldn't be the goal. Cause I already, I already know I can write a book. So the second goal was maybe I can write a book with a female mom as a, as a protagonist, as a main character, because I'm neither of those things. And we didn't even have kids at the time. Right. And so <laughs> I was like, well, let's see how, how genius of a writer I am. I mean, just get in the head of a, of a female protagonist, right? Oh, I can do that. Um, right. Again, being very naive and stupid. And, um, but that was the goal. And so I think it was a mistake because I was not ready for something like that, um, right. for really trying to get in and, and be, be a good, good enough writer to pull that off. Um, but it was a mistake that worked out because it allowed me to see a lot of the cracks in my writing and, and you know, where I, so here's, here's what happened. It's called the depths. I've again, since gone back and tried to fix it. It's still a horrendous, um, abysmal uh, book, honestly. Um, but the story's fun. It's, I guess it's not bad. It's just, I failed. Um, half of the book is the theme is it's, and I always write in the third person, but it's a close narrative, you know, point mm-hmm. of view. Yeah. Um, close narration, whatever. And so you're really in their head um, in a sense. And, um, and so I don't even remember her name. It's funny because um, I, th- my editor at the time said, "Hey, um, every single character starts with a J. Oh gosh, you need to I change some too. names. So, 
I think you had to change the name. So I'm serious. Originally, her name I think was Julie, but that's also the main character in my my Harvey Bennett series. Yeah. Um, so this is so I don't remember what her name was. Where you yeah. can't remember it. It's totally yeah. fine. Yeah, I, I just I blocked it out of my mind. It's <laughs> it's, it's long forgotten. Um, this is very true. Uh, they were all named Jay. I had like a, I had a John. I had a Jacob. I had a Jingleheimer Schmidt. I think. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was just everything, right? It had all of them. And so my editor was like, "You, this is ridiculous. You have to change them." So I did a massive find and replace. Mm-hmm. And now when a reader reaches out and they're like, "Hey, why did Blake do this?" And I'm like, "I don't know who the hell." Blake is yeah <laughs> who are you talking about um not only was it a hundred years ago I don't know who Blake is you know I, I changed yeah. that it was some other character it's probably Jonathan yeah um, anyway so whoever she was the main character um of the depths which is a terrible name to the depths um yeah. just uh, doesn't doesn't exactly roll off the tongue does it um she was the main character clearly the main protagonist in the first half of the book and then at some point i was like i can't do this anymore okay it's now about her estranged husband he's the main character i'm just gonna who, nobody's gonna notice right we're just gonna keep going um and then john or jacob or whoever it was like became the main character i'm, I'm literally not even kidding you oh, he is the hilarious. main character for the, the latter half of the book right so um oh. yeah i did that <laughs> <laughs> that's a thing okay, so that happened you were just um, ahead of your time because now in mystery exactly this thing yeah. where like there's like the story within the story and i read one of these the other day and i'm going along and i'm all interested in character a and we get about two-thirds of the way in and all of a sudden we're in character b story and i was like wait a minute i was not ready what happened you know it's so like it's it's a nested story so you were just ahead of your time yeah. <laughs> Just ahead of my time. It's art. That's what it is. No, and, and to be, I mean, honestly, so I had, um, I guess the way I describe, so, you know, what I do is pretty much all my books, there's the Mason Dixon series is, uh, is first person, but uh, most of them are third person. And I do jump from one point of view to another, but the main character is like 80% or maybe 70% of the, of the chapters. Mm-hmm. Are, are from their point of view. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then I'll do a bunch that are in um, the, the villain or antagonist point of view. Sure. Um, sure. And then there'll be some B character, right? So that's what I'm talking about. But mm-hmm. but I literally changed who the main, in my <laughs> mind, like the main character changed to the, the dude. Because I was like, I don't know anything about being a mom. I don't think about being a woman. I'm just hey. gonna, I could be a dude. <laughs> you know, um, never oh, mind that so I like funny. pretended he was a special forces dude. And I'm, I'm not that either, you know? So, it was a mistake, um, but I learned from it. And the mistake that I'm glad I made that mistake then, um, because now <laughs> there's a lot more on the line, you know, if I were to yeah. make a mistake like that now. Exactly. Right? Exactly. Uh, but it really did force me into, okay, okay fine. I'm going to, all right, Dwight Swain, you helped me through the first book. Let me read your character book and help me through this one. And, uh, and <laughs> let me figure out how to do this better next time. So <laughs> the third book, the goal was, well, now that I've successfully written a book and I've successfully gotten into the mind of a female, a mom, uh, let me successfully write a story where the, there's two main characters and it's a male female relationship. Right. Mm-hmm. And that one actually worked. That was the enigma strain. And that became a, it's now a 12 book series. Right. Yeah. So yeah, something happened that, that worked in that book. <laughs> That's um, great. <laughs> writing that wave. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> well, what about the opposite? Have you had something that you thought this is a home run and then it just fell flat. It didn't do what you wanted it to do. Yeah. The Mason Dixon series that I just mentioned, um, that was, you know, I wouldn't call it an abysmal failure. It's it sold, but I, I put a lot of, of blood, sweat and tears into that one and, uh, and didn't get extract what I, what I assumed would, would come from it. Mm-hmm. I was already successful with Harvey Bennett. I think I was probably, I don't even know. I probably around book five or six, um, as you know, writing book six, maybe but writing book five, I don't know. And I was sitting down one night and I had a glass of whiskey and, uh, and I was like, ah, you know, I just want to write a book about whiskey. Like, I want whiskey to be the main character. I don't even want to, like, forget characters. I'm done. I just want to write about whiskey. <laughs> I wasn't drunk. I mean, it sounds like I am, yeah. but I wasn't. I, I was just, like, really what it was is I'm, like, this closet mixologist. I liked, you know, mixing drinks and not necessarily drinking them, but I just liked the chemistry of it, right? Mm-hmm. And I thought that was fun. So I created this whole idea of a bartender um, who just wants to make classy drinks for classy people. Um, but, oh, you know, he's going to pay off his bar. And so in order to do that, he takes a, he moonlights as an assassin. Um, so he's a bartender assassin and it was going to be edgy, but kind of funny, still crime, but going to have mm-hmm. a lot of that humor in there. A lot of the sarcasm, you know, mm-hmm. um, and, uh, and was going to name him Mason Dixon because his parents were, were jerks. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's, you know, in South Carolina. Right. And mm-hmm. so I did all that and, and I wrote three books in the series and I really think they're, they're good. They're fun. Um, they're first person. So it's, it gets a little bit, you know, closer and more intimate than a third person might. Um, and they just didn't really take off. Mm-hmm. You know, I think mm-hmm. I just, Honestly, I think it's mostly because um, my list, my my mailing list that I've been building was all Harvey Bennett. It was all this, you know, action, mm-hmm. adventure, archaeological. Mm-hmm. 
Indiana Jones meets National Treasure. And now here I am throwing in like a, um, I don't even know what movie it would be like. Maybe that's the problem. Um, but this completely different style and this completely, mm-hmm. it's first person, it's crime rather than thriller, yeah. you know? Mm-hmm. Right. Um, so I don't know. I, I'd still get some, some readers who reach out and say, hey, I need more Mason Dixon stuff. And I, you know, where's the fourth book going to come? And we'll see. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if I'll have time. I mean, I want to, I want to write them, but I want, I mean, don't we all, we want to write everything. Sure. I don't know yeah. Ever get <laughs> to it. part of our problem. <laughs> yeah. Everything sounds great. Part of the problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's always right, another yeah. idea. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, you have some nonfiction for writers and um, one of your books is um, Platform Mastery. So, and in that one, you talk about kind of expanding your um, platform beyond just books. So can you talk about that a little bit about how um, you, have you done that personally or how can, what would you recommend somebody who wants to get started doing that? Yeah, um, it is a long, it is a long conversation, but the, the gist of it is I got to the point where I realized, I think all of us are on a, on a level and we want to get to the next level. Most of us, you know, some of, some of us are happy on a level and that's fine. Mm-hmm. Um, but a lot of us are on a level and we want to get to the next level. And for me, it, it became, well, Hey, if I want to get to that next level, I probably should define what the levels are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so in platform mastery, I just, these are arbitrary, but I mean, they're mine. They're, they're mm-hmm. for me um, and potentially helpful for other writers. But the point is to, to figure out what your levels are and then deconstruct them to be able to get to the next one. And that's what I did in platform mastery was, for me, for Nick Thacker, here's what these eight levels are. I've identified eight from all the way from, Hey, I wrote a book to like, Hey, I'm, you know, I empire of the, you know, emperor of the world or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, uh, or what does Elon Musk call himself? Imperator of Mars. Um, <laughs> that, that, but that, you know, for me, the eighth level was like, Hey, people are just now paying you to show up to, to be a keynote speaker at an event or just to, to glad hand people and all that. Um, if that's what I defined as like the top level, um, how do I, how could I get there? You Mm -hmm. know? And that's what I tried to break down in in platform mastery uh, was these eight levels. And I tried to make it um, uh, not generic, but, but broad enough that every, every level sort of makes sense for most authors. Like we can see that there's a level there where, okay, now we've written these books. Um, How can I have some other things in the universe that aren't books that I can, Mm -hmm. I can sell and make some money with? Um, Because the whole point of it was, you know, this idea of, okay, well, I want to get to the next level, but I can only write X amount of words a day. Like I will right. get to the, there's only one of me. Right. And that's probably the one, the only thing that I, only I can do um, right. good or bad. I, only Nick Thacker can write Nick Thacker books and only Sarah can write Sarah book. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so without having to somehow find extra time in the day and write more books, what can we do um, to, to sort of tack on these other things in our careers that won't take that time, you know, that we can right. still write books at, at our, at our pace. But so that was what the book is about. Um, it's, I think it's good. It's actually a, a rewrite of an earlier book called welcome home that I wrote many, many years ago. I was keynoting at a small conference in Texas actually. And um, <laughs> I, I gave a couple talks and this idea of, you know, your website, your, the thing you own is your home base. Um, the mm-hmm. things you don't own like Facebook page or Amazon book page um, are your outposts, Right. And I should have kept the baseball analogy, like the home base. And then those are your mm-hmm. first, second, third. Well, I didn't because I was an idiot. Um, but it, the book was called Welcome Home. And it was about how to build that home base, uh, which was your online platform. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was really, really uh, diving into um, the, the platform stuff and getting into like how to set up a website and all that. And I realized um, about five years after that, you know, hey, this stuff is going to get dated every time I try to do it. immediately is going to be dated. Yeah. So I need to kind of zoom out a little bit and, uh, and, and start writing from the standpoint of generalities or like, mm-hmm. you know, how to, how to build a platform without talking about specific tactics. And so that's, that book became platform mastery, um, which is, is actually the first book in a series. And the third one will be about email, but, and I'm working on that now, but the second one is about how to get a book bub featured deal. Um, I have one every two months. It seems like clockwork. Now I get a feature deal every two months and it's not, um, random, you know, it's, there's things that you can do. It's not guaranteed either, but there's things that you can Mm -hmm. do to build a system, to put that in place so that you can better position yourself in the eyes of, uh, the book bub overlords. Um, so anyway, if that's of interest, anybody listening that that one's out there as well. Mm. Um, uh, but yeah, that's what those, those, that series is about indie, indie mastery is what I'm calling it. Or that's, great. Mastery. that's great. Yeah. Well, I know people are um, curious. So like, do you have like just a couple of quick tips for BookBub? Um, that- 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, basically, this is what the book is about. It's, um, you know, they, they put on their website very clearly what the requirements are. And if you really look at them, there's little things that you notice, like uh, they ask for um, you to resubmit a book every four weeks rather than every month. Mm-hmm. Um, well, that's different. It's 28 days rather than every mm-hmm. 30, 31 days, mm-hmm. right? And so by doing that, by kind of really drilling down and sort of um, hacking what they what they list publicly on their website, you can develop a system where you're submitting a book. Essentially, if you have enough books, you're submitting every single day mm-hmm. because you don't have to wait. Their rules mm-hmm. don't state that you have to wait for them to decline you before you submit mm-hmm. the next one. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I can't remember the number, but it's it's not as many as you might think. It's like, you know, eight books or 10 books or whatever, and you could submit right. that every day. <laughs> Um, and it's half that number if you want to submit um, a book that's free and then the next day a book that's maybe 99 cents, it can be the same book. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, a lot of people then then let BookBub choose mm-hmm. if they right. want to take more money from you or less money from you and do free right. and paid. Um, so there's things like that. And so it, and I actually developed, a, we were speaking about spreadsheets. I did. Mm-hmm. I made a, a Google sheet. It was an Excel spreadsheet that I turned into a Google sheet. Um, and it does a lot of these calculations for you. So you just put all your books in and you put the dates that it's in KU. Um, the big part of it was for me, I'm, I'm exclusive. And so I wanted to have KU, but I don't think you need it um, necessarily. Um, anyway, and and you put your dates in there. And so it calculates, you know, when your 90 day window is up. And that's important because Amazon um, lies um, and I'll, I'll go to my grave admitting this, but <laughs> they lie about, you know, that 90 days you get for your free book days. Or that those five days you can mm-hmm. use, they can mm-hmm. use in any of the any day of the ninety day. That's not true. Mm-hmm. You can't book a free free promo the first second day of that ninety day window or right. the last day, right? Right. And so it's they. You need to know that when you're doing a book bub because there's three days that are right in the middle of that changeover where you can't mm-hmm. get a book bub or you're going to be hosed. Mm-hmm. Um, so anyway, it calculates that kind of stuff and essentially just reorganizes the list of books saying, okay, well, you had a book bub on this one, so you can't have one again for another six months. So that goes to the bottom of the list. Mm-hmm. Um, and you've submitted this one. Um, and so that one goes to the bottom of the list. And then the first book on there is the book that you need to submit that day. Mm-hmm. And then again, if it's enough books that you can do that every day, you just check the spreadsheet and resubmit. Mm-hmm. Um, Ricardo Fayette of, uh, of Reedsy, and we probably mm-hmm. all know who he is, um, mm-hmm. actually asked me if he could use that and and he wrote a whole blog post and stuff and then worked on the spreadsheet, made it way better because he's a nerd um, and then um, published that. So that actually, I don't even recommend the spreadsheet I link to. It's the same one, mm-hmm. but he's improved it a lot. So I actually point people to the Reedsy blog. Wow. Um, okay. well, we'll link to that. So if you don't, you don't have to get the book, just go, go link to it and, um, and you can get the same spreadsheet that I'm talking about, but the book does help explain it yeah. is all. So it just tells mm-hmm. you why, you know? Yeah. We'll Sorry, that, both was of those. Less, that was more than quick tips. <laughs> no, it was great though. It's great. So tell us about email. Dot, I mean, author. Email. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, and actually, you know, so it, author. Email will get you there. Um, we actually use author. Email. Com. Once you're in the oh, system okay. and everything, it makes things a little smoother. Mm-hmm. There's some things that break with author. Email that we're working on, but um, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's an email service provider, an ESP, as uh, Mailchimp is, or Aweber, or Constant Contact but it is exclusively for authors by authors. And so the benefit of that is we don't have to spend nearly as much time, energy, and money uh, making sure we're not getting spammers in there, internet marketers, um, mm-hmm. not that they're bad people. They're just doing things that make it a lot harder for everybody. Okay. Um, right. You know, they're on a, their website's on a shared box, right? And then right. they do something spammy and Russia gets mad and shuts everybody. Yeah. We don't have to worry about that because it's just authors doing author stuff and we don't do bad stuff as authors. We're, mm-hmm. we're cool people. Um, and so what that translates to is a far cheaper alternative to a lot of the uh, ESPs out there. Um, for example, I think it's eleven ninety nine or ten ninety nine right now for up to 10,000 subscribers a month, unlimited sends, autoresponders, everything you would want in a system. And this is key and nothing more. Mm-hmm. Um, MailChimp lately, uh, and I love Mail. They're good guys. I know Ben, like they're, they're good people. Um, they've transitioned from the business model of email service provider to like customer relations management or CRM tool. Mm-hmm. Um, well, a lot of us don't need that, right? Mm-hmm. We don't need the sales funnel, the sales yeah. force type stuff. Um, it's great that they're building it, but I don't really want to pay 350 bucks a month for it. Yeah. And so we, we set up author email um, as, as an alternative to that. Again, it was literally, it was just for me and, and Kevin Tomlinson, my partner, um, just for us. And, you know, the, the idea was, sure, if it ever works, then we could try to, you know, open it to other authors. But at this point, you know, we just don't want to spend, 
I had uh, 50,000 subscribers on my mailing list and now mm-hmm. I've, I'm up to like 70. You can imagine, or you don't have to imagine, you yeah. can literally go see what that would cost at any of those other places. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have a calculator right there on authoremail.com website um, that shows, you know, and we're, we're like, this doesn't need to cost that much. Um, one, we don't need to have a bunch of server racks, you know, hosting email um, computers in our basement or garage or whatever, because Amazon Web Services and a thousand other companies do this already. They they yeah. can host everything and they can mm-hmm. rent us space on those boxes. So um, the combination of being cloud supported, um, meaning it's all you know virtual out there, and happens by magic, um, and focusing only on authors and exclusively authors lets us keep it very inexpensive. Um, and yet we've got an a IP reputation that's world-class and uh, everything is deliverability is exactly what you would expect anywhere else. Um, you know, normal caveats apply. You know, if you're sending um, emails, open rate doesn't really tell you much information. So anyway, yeah, all, all that yeah. stuff to say, there's a lot of technical things we could go into, but um, it works just the same way you'd want something else to work. Um, where it's not the same as other things are we're brand new and it's, mm-hmm. it's run by just a couple people. So, um, the feature set is there, but it may not look as pretty yet. You know, that's the kind of stuff that we're like, Hey, let's get it built and get it working. Um, just know that you're using a, a platform that's, that doesn't have, you know, 50,000, um, programmers yeah. behind it. Yeah. That's are fantastic you, though. Are you still in beta or is it open? We call it an open beta. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's not technically beta, um, as in, I mean, it, it works. We've been, we've been on it for almost coming up on probably seven years now. Um, Kevin and I have been using it. We've sent, you know, 20 million emails through it. I mean, it works, it's yeah. not going to break. Um, but like I said, we call it open beta because, you know, there's features that we want to include, um, that aren't core to the, to the system, but that are, that would be handy. Um, and it's just, it's slower going than, you know, a, a, a MailChimp type corporation would be able to bump things out. So we call it open beta just so that people have in the back of their mind, okay, this is still being worked on. You know, if there's mm-hmm. some, some rough around the edges about the, the mm-hmm. interface or something um, we can't get too mad. That's our hope that people can't get too mad at us for it. So, but no, it's, it's open, it's working great. And uh, um, yeah, we're just taking on new people right now. There is a waiting list because everybody is, like I said, it's exclusive to authors. So we're manually approving, you know, we're not going to di- do a deep dive or anything. We want to make sure you have a book or you're working on a book or you, you are mm-hmm. who you say you are. You know, if you sign up with like RussianBot at gmail.com, chances are we're going to ask you some questions. Um, but uh, the waiting yeah. list right now is it's about a week long. So you can go go to the Get Started page and get on the waiting list. And about a week, maybe a little bit less, you'll get an email that says, hey, we're ready for you. Um, you got to verify a couple um, links. Or we, we send you some links from our delivery servers to make sure that you own that email address and then mm-hmm. you're good to go. Mm-hmm. That's great. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. I didn't. I guess I didn't realize you were doing that. That's just fantastic. We and and that's the other part we're saying we're in beta. You know, we uh, because we're doing just us. Like we don't want to open up to the big wide world and start really advertising, marketing, and everything until we have the customer support side in yeah. place, right? Sure. Because sure, people are going to have issues, and we we want to make sure we're. Um, it's um, uh, you know jerks like Damon Damon Courtney. Uh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I love the guy, uh, but he's set up kind of a, he's sort of set the bar for customer yeah. support and drafted mm-hmm. digital. They yes. set the bar for yeah yeah. There's, that's it's amazing. We want to do that too, and so um, we just until we do that until we get to that point where we can feel comfortable. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm the guy answering those support emails, you yeah. know, and so it's like well, yeah. I'm I'm also a writer and you know right. So I I cannot provide support for fifty thousand customers right, right. personally. Yeah. They just can't yeah. do it. Yeah, so, probably rather um, be writing. We're, we're sort right? of waiting on. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, what do you so, see coming in publishing in the next couple of years? Next couple of years, um, you know, it, it sounds like that's so so soon, or maybe mm-hmm. it doesn't. I don't know. But in the internet world, and especially today's world of of having twenty twenty just sort of happen to us all at once, it uh, it in a lot of ways it it was um, good for advancement in technology, right? Mm-hmm. Because it was like, hey, well, now we all have to. Our my kindergartner has to figure out Zoom. Yeah. Um, you know, and so there's some things that are coming down the pike, I think that are either in the works or they're out, but just not known yet. And I think a big one is the use of AI for mm-hmm. authors, um, as a sort of, um, an additional support mechanism for what we do day to day. Meaning mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not saying that, um, in two years, authors are going to be obsolete and AI will start writing our fiction for us. Although <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, that, that may be 10, 20 years down the road, we may have something like that, but don't worry. I think right now, two years from now, we're going to have 
um, a lot of authors coming on board with the idea that rather than a VA, I can have, you know, an AI assistant, write mm-hmm. Some of this copy for me mm-hmm. and do some of these, um, these, these ad campaigns for me. Um, personally, I'm using AI to translate my books and then paying somebody to do a proofread of them. So I don't have to do a really deep translation edit um, that costs, you know, thousands of dollars. I think it's great. I think translators are very useful, um, but I don't have the money to invest in a 12 book series to get translated, see if it's going to work in Germany, right? So um, I'm using an AI tool called DeepL. Um, mm-hmm. Joanna Penn talks about this as well a lot, and it, yeah. it's incredible. It does a lot of really good work. And so I have a German-speaking um, American. Uh, she's actually living in Germany. She's been there for many, many years, friend of mine. And she's reading through it, and she goes, I got to say, I'm I'm honestly surprised at how good this is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's coming from somebody who translates English to German, right? And so yeah. that tells me, you know, hey, of course, it's not going to be perfect, but it's probably an M- MVP, right? It's a minimum mm-hmm. viable product to see if Germany is a good market. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm using AI for things like, um, uh, social media. I I hate social media with a passion and, but I think it's necessary in certain things, um, at at the very least for, you know, announcements and things like that. And Mm -hmm. so I'm using AI tools to write some of those posts for me, um, Mm -hmm. and to schedule them. Certainly. Um, Mm -hmm. one of the things that I would love to work on, again, I'm not a developer programmer that could be able to do this, but machine learning similar Mm -hmm. to AI, but machine learning is going to be. Um, much more um, mainstream, I think, in the next couple of years. Um, because, I, I mean, every big company from IBM to Amazon to Google is working on some sort of machine learning, um, I don't want to say algorithm because it's not that, but um, <laughs> mechanism that they're going to open to, or that they would probably open to the public uh, for a small fee and then let developers, you know, similar to what they're doing with AI, you know, anyway, the point is um, one, one of the things I would like to see is um, I, I finish a book, I write a book um, in whatever format I upload it to a website. And then um, a couple hours later, it spits out uh, the audio book read by a, a, a fake narrator. Um, it's, it's, it does a cover design for me based on the book's content and in seeing what else is out there, designs it for me. And then of course, all the formats, you know, EPUB, wow. we don't use Mobi anymore. We're not going to use that anymore, but um, EPUB, DocX or whatever, PDF, you know, um, print ready, all that stuff just done. Right. Mm. And so that's sort of duct taping together all these different things that actually already exist. And they may, they may mm-hmm. not be there yet. Right. But there are text to speech algorithms. Amazon mm-hmm. Polly has one, IBM, Google, both have them um, mm-hmm. that are pretty dang good. And, uh, and the next phase of that is to then spend two or three hours in front of a microphone recording your own voice, mm-hmm. reading script on the page, and then having that machine learning um, computer be able to parse it and say, okay, now I've created a Nick Thacker voice. Mm-hmm. And you can read, quote unquote, read your own books in your own voice and have it narrated. I, again, I don't think this means um, narrators are going to be out of work. It's going to make it a little bit more competitive, sure. But um, there's going to be, the, this is what Joanna Penn keeps saying, is there's going to be different tiers, right? You can have... Yeah if you just want the book in audio format and you don't really care a whole lot, then you can have an, an AI read version of it, um, which sounds, it's it literally it sounds like a human. Cause it is, it's you recording samples of your voice. Um, but it may, may lack some of the nuance or some of the, the acting skills of, of the professional narrators. And that could be the next tier. Somebody could say, you know what, I'm going to pay 30 bucks for this audio version because it's got multiple narrators and it's just really well done and maybe music and sound mm-hmm. effects and all that. But, Anyway, I'll stop there. There's a thousand things I could say, um, but I think that's a big one, AI, machine learning. And then the last one is I think recommendations engines are years behind where they should be. We know how much data Amazon and Facebook have. Why the hell am I not getting ads for books that I can? So here's the deal. I go to bed right there and I read at night for about, I don't know, five minutes before I fall asleep. Um, And so I'm reading on my Kindle, which is connected to Wi-Fi, sending information back to Amazon's, you know, secret laboratory. They know exactly, or they could know exactly how much I read and what I like to read. Why are they not advertising books to me that, Hey, you can read every chapter of this book in five minutes before you fall Mm -hmm. asleep. Mm -hmm. Um, Right. And so rather than having to stop in the middle of a, of a chapter, I can get to the end of one and then I'm tired and I fall asleep. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of stuff that I think is coming. um, Hopefully, honestly, you know, Yeah. Uh, I've always said that I'm, I'm not opposed to commercials on TV if they could just figure out how to make them things I want to buy. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, like I, I want a Traeger grill advertised to me. I want a cool Netflix show advertised to me. And then I want, I don't know, like a super soaker, super soaker. What happened yeah. to those? Like we all like super soakers, right? I want one. Um, 
you know, but when you advertise like a, like a, a old person pill or whatever, I'm like, well, I don't, I'm not even, I don't even know what that is. Like I'm not mm-hmm. there yet. I'm, I'm pretty old, right. but I'm not that old, you know? So yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Very all interesting. Good, all good yeah. thoughts. And I'm not definitely not a futurist. Me but either. That's, I mean, I can see the way things are going and it helps me to follow people like you and John Penn that really that love that and are very interested in that. I personally am looking forward to an AI who will help me uh, proofread and catch all my typos <laughs> and do some yes. of my research. <laughs> yeah. I think that's, that's probably an easy one, right? I mean, yeah. we've got the Grammarly and pro writing a type stuff. That's pretty much there. Mm-hmm. Um, it's going to catch 80% of the mistakes. Mm-hmm. You know, now it's just getting to the nuance and mm-hmm. understanding the English language a little bit better. And or GPT three, which can, is the open AI, you know, they're getting close. Very close. Yeah. Sorry. Or if they can realize this is Sarah's book and she has a tendency to forget this kind of comma or whatever. That would be helpful too. Or this yeah. error, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, early on in, you know, my writing career, I, everybody began to do something. Nobody actually walked. They began to walk across the room. You know, they yeah. began to run. He began to shoot. He began to, you know, so that was for me, that would be in my library, right? My machine learning yeah. library would say, oh, it's a Thacker book. Um, you expect a lot of neck shots and like random, um, you know, uh, characters that are just going to get killed off later. Um, we need yeah. to keep track of how many there are because he always forgets how many, you know, um, soldiers exactly. there are left. Yeah, um, things like that would then, be great. Yeah. Yeah. It would for, really help. for proofreading it, yeah. yeah, in the final drafting stage. Well, it's been great to have you here. And we like to ask our guests, um, what do you think the best thing you've done to set yourself up for success is, Nick? Oh, that's a big question. Um, for me, I, it always comes back to planning um, mm-hmm. and, and very purposeful uh, I don't want to call it meditation because it's it's not technically not meditation, but um, this meditative planning process where I can get away from computing and AI and machine learning and writing and everything um, and just figure out who I am and what I want to do next. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't get to do that often enough. And when I don't, I start to suffer. I mean, the, the writing starts mm-hmm. to suffer and things don't happen as they should. Um, you know, right in front of me, I'm, I'm, I'm planning out, I've got I've, I've a new book called The 12 Wook sorry, it's not, it's a new book to me. It's called the 12 week year. Um, it's pretty self-explanatory. It's just, mm-hmm. instead of thinking of a year ahead, think about 12 weeks at a time mm-hmm. being a new year. Um, and so I'm trying that out as like a, a planning mechanism. Now I will say I'm sort of addicted to like the productivity and planning mm-hmm. stuff. I, we all like to buy planners and journals and all that, mm-hmm. but what I'm talking about, um, and that's all good. What I'm talking about is figuring out like me at my core, man, I get, I know that I get distracted easily. Like I said, I want to go build um, this thing over here and spend five days doing it at the expense of my writing. Um, mm-hmm. And so for me to just detach from everything and and maybe it's just going for a walk on the beach since I live in Hawaii, that's always a good place to get, you know, <laughs> inspiration um, or even just going to a brewery and grabbing a beer and just sitting without a computer and just mm-hmm. writing in a journal. Like, Hey, what, how can I get grounded? Essentially? That's another word, right? How can I yeah. figure out what it is I want to do um, and what's most important? Because it always comes down to, um, Hey, the books aren't important compared to my kids. So why am I stressed about the books? Like, is it money? Like, am I worried I'm not going to make money and then I can't help my kid? So stuff, just re kind of jiggering all my like uh, brain, you know, farts and stuff. I don't know. Um, Getting it clarified enough uh, so that I can, I can say without a doubt, okay, I'm going to sit down today and do this, but here's the reason why Mm -hmm. Um, that has always led to more success than less success, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, That's always been really, really helpful for me. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Perspective. So important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. See, you're smarter than I am. I should have just said perspective. That's <laughs> that's exactly what I'm talking about. Just get the, the clarity, the perspective. Just yes, do that. Listen to what Sarah says all the time. Uh, if anyone listening, no, don't listen to me. Oh, that's been it's been great talking to you. And you have some been fun. great and interesting thoughts. So mm-hmm. and we'll have all the uh, links to all the things you mentioned in the show notes, and those can be found at um, wish I'd known then podcast.com. But where can people find out more about you? Um, website's the best place, nickthacker.com. Um, I said, I hate social media. So if you tweet me, I will probably, it'll land somewhere. I don't know who's reading those, <laughs> probably an AI. Um, I wouldn't expect a response. Um, I've got a Facebook author page. Um, I use Facebook personally as well. Um, those are good places to just find me. Um, I'm pretty Googleable, much to the dismay of Nick Thacker, the dentist in California. Um, <laughs> he's like on the second page now, but he should carry your books, um, that's his right? Fault. I got there first. <laughs> he should. He should probably carry my books and I should use him for dentistry. Um, 
that's probably the best place to find me, nickthacker.com. And of course you can shoot me an email. I, I love to chat and, uh, and obviously I love to talk. So reach out and ask me questions or tell me how I'm wrong. I love to learn. So, um, yeah, All right. <laughs> that's probably, Very good. probably it is the website. All right. Sounds great. Thanks for being here. Yes. Thank Thanks you. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure. All right. And Thanks to Alexa Larberg for editing and producing the podcast. And we'll see everybody next week. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.